This is section twelve of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume one, part one, eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six. Chapter twelve. Tom Sawyer's Band. Read by John Greenman. They ranged from Holliday's Hill on the north to the cave on the south and over the fields and through all the woods about. They navigated the river from Turtle Island to Glasscock's Island, now Pearl, or Tom Sawyer's Island, and far below. They penetrated the wilderness of the Illinois shore. They could run like wild turkeys and swim like ducks. They could handle a boat as if born in one. No orchard or melon patch was entirely safe from them, no dog or slave patrol so vigilant that they did not sooner or later elude it. They borrowed boats when their owners were not present. Once, when they found this too much trouble, they decided to own a boat, and one Sunday gave a certain borrowed craft a coat of red paint, formerly it had been green, and secluded it for a season up Bear Creek. They borrowed the paint also, and the brush though they carefully returned these the same evening about nightfall, so the painter could have them Monday morning. Tom Blankenship rigged up a sail for the new craft, and Sam Clemens named it Cecilia, after which they didn't need to borrow boats any more, though the owner of it did, and he sometimes used to observe as he saw it pass that, if it had been any other color but red, he would have sworn it was his. Some of their expeditions were innocent enough. They often cruised up to Turtle Island, about two miles above Hannibal, and spent the day feasting. You could have loaded a car with turtles and their eggs up there, and there were quantities of mussels and plenty of fish. Fishing and swimming were their chief pastimes, with general marauding for adventure. Where the railroad bridge now ends on the Missouri side was their favorite swimming hole that and along Bear Creek, a secluded, limpid water with special interests of its own. Sometimes at evening they swam across to Glasscock's Island, the rendezvous of Tom Sawyer's Black Avengers, and the hiding place of Huck and Nigger Jim. Then, when they had frolicked on the sandbar at the head of the island for an hour or more, they would swim back in the dusk, a distance of half a mile, breasting the strong, steady Mississippi current, without exhaustion or fear. They could swim all day, likely enough, those graceless young scamps. Once, though this was considerably later, when he was sixteen, Sam Clemens swam across to the Illinois side, and then turned and swam back again without landing, a distance of at least two miles, as he had to go. He was seized with a cramp on the return trip. His legs became useless and he was obliged to make the remaining distance with his arms. It was a hardy life they led, and it is not recorded that they ever did any serious damage, though they narrowly missed it sometimes. One of their Sunday pastimes was to climb Holliday's Hill and roll down big stones to frighten the people who were driving to church. Holliday's Hill above the road was steep. A stone, once started, would go plunging and leaping down and bound across the road with the deadly swiftness of a twelve-inch shell. The boys would get a stone poised, then wait until they saw a team approaching, and, calculating the distance, would give it a start. Dropping down behind the bushes, they would watch the dramatic effect upon the churchgoers as the great missile shot across the road a few yards before them. This was Homeric sport, but they carried it too far. Stones that had a habit of getting loose so numerously on Sundays and so rarely on other days invited suspicion, and the patterollers, river patrol, a kind of police of those days, were put on the watch. So the boys found other diversions until the patterollers did not watch any more. Then they planned a grand coup that would eclipse anything before attempted in the stone-rolling line. A rock about the size of an omnibus was lying up there, in a good position to go downhill, once started. They decided it would be a glorious thing to see that great boulder go smashing down a hundred yards or so in front of some unsuspecting and 
peaceful-minded churchgoer. Quarrymen were getting out rock not far away, and left their picks and shovels over Sundays. The boys borrowed these, and went to work to undermine the big stone. It was a heavier job than they had counted on, but they worked faithfully Sunday after Sunday. If their parents had wanted them to work like that, they would have thought they were being killed. Finally, one Sunday, while they were digging, it suddenly got loose and started down. They were not quite ready for it. Nobody was coming but an old colored man in a cart, so it was going to be wasted. It was not quite wasted, however. They had planned for a thrilling result, and there was thrill enough while it lasted. In the first place, the stone nearly caught Will Bowen when it started. John Briggs had just that moment quit digging and handed Will the pick. Will was about to step into the excavation when Sam Clemens, who was already there, leapt out with a yell, "'Look out, boys! She's coming!' She came. The huge stone kept to the ground at first. Then, gathering a wild momentum, it went bounding into the air. About halfway down the hill it struck a tree several inches through and cut it clean off. This turned its course a little, and the negro in the cart, who heard the noise, saw it come crashing in his direction and made a wild effort to whip up his horse. It was also headed toward a cooper shop across the road. The boys watched it with growing interest. It made longer leaps with every bound, and whenever it struck the fragments the dust would fly. They were certain it would demolish the negro and destroy the cooper shop. The shop was empty, it being Sunday but the rest of the catastrophe would invite close investigation, with results. They wanted to fly, but they could not move until they saw the rock land. It was making mighty leaps now, and the terrified negro had managed to get directly in its path. They stood holding their breath, their mouths open. Then, suddenly, they could hardly believe their eyes. The boulder struck a projection a distance above the road, and with a mighty bound sailed clear over the negro and his mule, and landed in the soft dirt beyond, only a fragment striking the shop, damaging, but not wrecking it. Half buried in the ground, that boulder lay there for nearly forty years. Then it was blasted up for milling purposes. It was the last rock the boys ever rolled down. They began to suspect that the sport was not altogether safe. Sometimes the boys needed money, which was not easy to get in those days. On one occasion of this sort Tom Blankenship had the skin of a coon he had captured, which represented the only capital in the crowd. At Selm's store on Wildcat Corner the coon skin would bring ten cents, but that was not enough. They arranged a plan which would make it pay a good deal more than that. Selen's window was open, it being summertime, and his pile of pelts was pretty handy. Huck, that is to say Tom, went in the front door and sold the skin for ten cents to Selms, who tossed it back on the pile. Tom came back with the money and, after a reasonable period, went around to the open window, crawled in, got the coon skin, and sold it to Selms again. He did this several times that afternoon. Then John Pierce, Selms' clerk, said, Look here, Selms, there is something wrong about this. That boy has been selling us coonskins all the afternoon. Selms went to his pile of pelts. There were several sheepskins and some cowhides, but only one coonskin, the one he had that moment bought. Selms himself used to tell this story as a great joke. Perhaps it is not adding to Mark Twain's reputation to say that the boy Sam Clemens, a pretty small boy, a good deal less than twelve at this time, was the leader of this unhallowed band, yet any other record would be less than historic. If the band had a leader it was he. They were always ready to listen to him, they would even stop fishing to do that, and to follow his projects. They looked to him for ideas and organization, whether the undertaking was to be real or make-believe. When they played bandit or pirate or Indian, Sam Clemens was always chief. When they became real raiders, it is recorded that he was no less distinguished. 
Like Tom Sawyer, he loved the glare and trappings of leadership. When the Christian sons of temperance came along with a regalia and a red sash that carried with it rank and the privilege of inventing passwords, the god of these things got into his eyes, and he gave up smoking, which he did rather gingerly, and swearing, which he did only under heavy excitement. Also liquor, though he had never tasted it yet, and marched with the newly washed and pure in heart for a full month, a month of splendid leadership and servitude. Then even the red sash could not hold him in bondage. He looked up Tom Blankenship and said, Say, Tom, I'm blamed tired of this. Let's go somewhere and smoke which must have been a good deal of a sacrifice, for the uniform was a precious thing. Limelight and the center of the stage was a passion of Sam Clemens' boyhood, a love of the spectacular that never wholly died. It seems almost a pity that in those far-off barefoot old days he could not have looked down the years to a time when, with the world at his feet, venerable Oxford should clothe him in a scarlet gown. He could not by any chance have dreamed of that stately honor. His ambitions did not lie in the direction of mental achievement. It is true that now and then, on Friday at school, he read a composition, one of which, a personal burlesque on certain older boys, came near resulting in bodily damage. But any literary ambition he may have had in those days was a fleeting thing. His permanent dream was to be a pirate, or a pilot, or a bandit, or a trapper scout, something gorgeous and active, where his word, his nod even, constituted sufficient law. The river kept the pilot ambition always fresh, and the cave supplied a background for those other things. The cave was an enduring and substantial joy. It was a real cave, not merely a hole, but a subterranean marvel of deep passages and vaulted chambers that led away into bluffs and far down into the earth's black silences, even below the river, some said. For Sam Clemens, the cave had a fascination that never faded. Other localities and diversions might pall, but any mention of the cave found him always eager and ready for the three-mile walk or pull that brought them to its mystic door. With its long corridors, its royal chambers hung with stalactites, its remote hiding places, its possibilities as the home of a gallant outlaw band, it contained everything that a romantic boy could love or long for. In Tom Sawyer, Indian Joe dies in the cave. He did not die there in real life, but was lost there once, and was living on bats when they found him. He was a dissolute reprobate and when one night he did die there came up a thunderstorm so terrific that sam clemens at home and in bed was certain that satan had come in person for the half-breed's wicked soul he covered his head and said his prayers industriously in the fear that the evil one might conclude to save another trip by taking him along too the treasure-digging adventure in the book had a foundation in fact there was a tradition concerning some French trappers who long before had established a trading post two miles above Hannibal, on what is called the Bay. It is said that while one of these trappers was out hunting, Indians made a raid on the post and massacred the others. The hunter on returning found his comrades killed and scalped, but the Indians had failed to find the treasure which was buried in a chest. He left it there, swam across to Illinois, and made his way to St. Louis, where he told of the massacre and the burial of the chest of gold. Then he started to raise a party to go back for it, but was taken sick and died. Later some men came up from St. Louis looking for the chest. They did not find it, but they told the circumstances, and afterward a good many people tried to find the gold. Tom Blankenship one morning came to Sam Clemens and John Briggs and said he was going to dig up the treasure. He said he had dreamed just where it was, and said if they would go with him and dig, he would divide up. The boys had great faith in dreams, especially Tom's dreams. 
Tom's unlimited freedom gave him a large importance in their eyes. The dreams of a boy like that were pretty sure to mean something. They followed Tom to the place with some shovels and a pick, and he showed them where to dig. Then he sat down under the shade of a pawpaw tree and gave orders. They dug nearly all day. Now and then they stopped to rest, and maybe to wonder a little why Tom didn't dig some himself. But of course he had done the dreaming, which entitled him to an equal share. They did not find it that day, and when they went back next morning they took two long iron rods. These they would push and drive into the ground until they struck something hard. Then they would dig down and see what it was, but it never turned out to be the money. That night the boys declared they would not dig any more, but Tom had another dream. He dreamed the gold was exactly under the little pawpaw tree. This sounded so circumstantial that they went back and dug another day. It was hot weather, too, August, and that night they were nearly dead. Even Tom gave it up then. He said there was something about the way they dug, but he never offered to do any digging himself. This differs considerably from the digging incident in the book, but it gives us an idea of the respect the boys had for the ragamuffin original of Huckleberry Finn. Much of the detail in this chapter was furnished to the writer by John Briggs shortly before his death in 1907. Tom Blankenship's brother, Ben, was also drawn upon for that creation, at least so far as one important phase of Huck's character is concerned. He was considerably older, as well as more disreputable, than Tom. He was inclined to torment the boys by tying knots in their clothes when they went swimming, or by throwing mud at them when they wanted to come out, and they had no deep love for him. But somewhere in Ben Blankenship there was a fine, generous strain of humanity that provided Mark Twain with that immortal episode in the story of Huck Finn in sheltering the nigger Jim. This is the real story. A slave ran off from Monroe County, Missouri, and got across the river into Illinois. Ben used to fish and hunt over there in the swamps, and one day found him. It was considered a most worthy act in those days to return a runaway slave. In fact, it was a crime not to do it. Besides, there was, for this one, a reward of fifty dollars, a fortune to ragged outcast Ben Blankenship. That money and the honor he could acquire must have been tempting to the waif, but it did not outweigh his human sympathy. Instead of giving him up and claiming the reward, Ben kept the runaway over there in the marshes all summer. The negro would fish, and Ben would carry him scraps of other food. Then, by and by, it leaked out. Some woodchoppers went on a hunt for the fugitive and chased him to what was called Bird Slough. There, trying to cross a drift, he was drowned. In the book, the author makes Huck's struggle a psychological one between conscience and the law on one side, and sympathy on the other. With Ben Blankenship, the struggle, if there was a struggle, was probably between sympathy and cupidity. He would care very little for conscience and still less for law. His sympathy with the runaway, however, would be large and elemental and it must have been very large to offset the lure of that reward. There was a gruesome sequel to this incident. Some days following the drowning of the runaway, Sam Clemens, John Briggs, and the Bowen boys went to the spot and were pushing the drift about, when suddenly the negro rose before them, straight and terrible, about half his length out of the water. He had gone down feet foremost, and the loosened drift had released him. The boys did not stop to investigate. They thought he was after them and flew in wild terror, never stopping until they reached human habitation. How many gruesome experiences there appear to have been in those early days! In The Innocents Abroad, Mark Twain tells of the murdered man he saw one night in his father's office. The man's name was McFarlane. He had been stabbed that day in the old hudson McFarlane feud and carried in there to die. Sam Clemens and John Briggs had run away from school and had been skylarking all that day and knew nothing of the affair. Sam decided that his father's office was safer for him 
than to face his mother, who was probably sitting up waiting. He tells us how he lay on the lounge and how a shape on the floor gradually resolved itself into the outlines of a man, how a square of moonlight from the window approached it and gradually revealed the dead face and the ghastly stabbed breast. I went out of there, he says. I do not say that I went away in any sort of a hurry, but I simply went. That is sufficient. I went out of the window, and I carried the sash along with me. I did not need the sash, but it was handier to take it than to leave it, and so I took it. I was not scared, but I was considerably agitated. He was not yet twelve, for his father was no longer alive when the boy reached that age. Certainly these were disturbing, haunting things. Then there was the case of the drunken tramp in the calaboose, to whom the boys kind-heartedly enough carried food and tobacco. Sam Clemens spent some of his precious money to buy the tramp a box of lucifer matches, a brand-new invention then, scarce and high. The tramp started a fire with the matches and burnt down the calaboose, himself in it. For weeks the boy was tortured, awake and in his dreams, by the thought that if he had not carried the man the matches the tragedy could not have happened. Remorse was always Samuel Clemens' surest punishment. To his last days on earth he never outgrew its pangs. What a number of things crowded themselves into a few brief years! It is not easy to curtail these boyhood adventures of Sam Clemens and his scapegrace friends, but one might go on indefinitely with their mad doings. They were an unpromising lot. Ministers and other sober-minded citizens freely prophesied sudden and violent ends for them and considered them hardly worth praying for. They must have proven a disappointing lot to those prophets. The Bowen boys became fine river pilots. Will Pitts was in due time a leading merchant and bank director. John Briggs grew into a well-to-do and highly respected farmer. Even Huck Finn, that is to say, Tom Blankenship, is reputed to have ranked as an honored citizen and justice of the peace in a western town. But in those days they were a riotous, fun-loving band, with little respect for order and even less for ordinance. End of chapter 12 Tom Sawyer's Band Read by John Greenman This is section 13 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 13 The Gentler Side. His associations were not all of that lawless breed. At his school, he had sampled several places of learning and was now at Mr. Cross's on the square, were a number of less adventurous, even if not intrinsically better, playmates. There was George Robards, the Latin scholar, and John, his brother, a handsome boy who rode away at last with his father into the sunset to California, his golden curls flying in the wind. And there was Jimmy McDaniel, a kind-hearted boy whose company was worth while because his father was a confectioner, and he used to bring candy and cake to school. Also there was Buck Brown, a rival speller, and John Meredith, the doctor's son, and John Garth, who was one day to marry little Helen Kerchival, and in the end would be remembered and honored with a beautiful memorial building not far from the site of the old school. Furthermore, there were a good many girls. Tom Sawyer had an impressionable heart, and Sam Clemens no less so. There was Betty Ormsley, and Artemisia Briggs, and Jenny Brady. Also Mary Miller, who was nearly twice his age, and gave him his first broken heart. I believe I was as miserable as a grown man could be, he said once, remembering. 
Tom Sawyer had heart sorrows, too, and we may imagine that his emotions at such times were the emotions of Sam Clemens, say, at the age of ten. But as Tom Sawyer had one faithful sweetheart, so did he. They were one and the same. Becky Thatcher in the book was Laura Hawkins in reality. The acquaintance of these two had begun when the Hawkins family moved into the Virginia house on the corner of Hill and Main Streets. The Hawkins family in real life bore no resemblance to the family of that name in the Gilded Age. Judge Hawkins of the Gilded Age, as already noted, was John Clemens. Mark Twain used the name Hawkins, also the name of his boyhood sweetheart Laura, merely for old time's sake and because in portraying the childhood of laura hawkins he had a picture of the real laura in his mind the clemens family was then in the new home across the way and the children were soon acquainted the boy could be tender and kind and was always gentle in his treatment of the other sex they visited back and forth especially around the new house where there were nice pieces of boards and bricks for playhouses so they played keeping house and if they did not always agree well since the beginning of the world sweethearts have not always agreed even in arcady once when they were building a house and there may have been some difference of opinion as to its architecture the boy happened to let a brick fall on the little girl's finger if there had been any disagreement it vanished instantly with that misfortune he tried to comfort her and soothe the pain then he wept with her and suffered most of the two no doubt so you see he was just a little boy after all even though he was already chief of a red-handed band the black avengers of the spanish main he was always a tender-hearted lad he would never abuse an animal unless as in the painkiller incident his tendency to pranking ran away with him he had indeed a genuine passion for cats summers when he went to the farm he never failed to take his cat in a basket when he ate it sat in the chair beside him at the table his sympathy included inanimate things as well he loved flowers not as the embryo botanist or gardener but as a personal friend he pitied the dead leaf and the murmuring dried weed of november because their brief lives were ended and they would never know the summer again or grow glad with another spring his heart went out to them to the river and the sky the sunlit meadow and the drifted hill that his observation of all nature was minute and accurate is shown everywhere in his writing but it was never the observation of a young naturalist it was the subconscious observation of a sympathetic love we are wandering away from his school days they were brief enough and came rapidly to an end they will not hold us long undoubtedly tom sawyer's distaste for school and his excuses for staying at home usually some pretended illness have ample foundation in the boyhood of sam clemens his mother punished him and pleaded with him alternately he detested school as he detested nothing else on earth even going to church church ain't worth shucks said tom sawyer but it was better than school as already noted the school of mr cross stood in or near what is now the square in hannibal the square was only a grove then grown up with plum hazel and vine a rare place for children at recess and the noon hour the children climbed trees gathered flowers and swung in grapevine swings there was a spelling bee every friday afternoon for sam the only endurable event of the school exercises he could hold the floor at spelling longer than buck brown this was spectacular and showy it invited compliments even from mr cross whose name must have been handed down by angels it fitted him so well one day sam clemens wrote on his slate cross by name and cross by nature cross jumped over an irish potato he showed this to john briggs who considered it a stroke of genius he urged the author to write it on the board at noon but the poet's ambition did not go so far 
"'Oh, pshaw,' said John. "'I wouldn't be afraid to do it.' "'I dare you to do it,' said Sam. John Briggs never took a dare, and at noon, when Mr. Cross was at home at dinner, he wrote flamingly the descriptive couplet. When the teacher returned and books were called, he looked steadily at John Briggs. He had recognized the penmanship. "'Did you do that?' he asked ominously. It was a time for truth. "'Yes, sir,' said John. "'Come here.' And John came and paid for his exploitation of genius heavily. Sam Clemens expected that the next call would be for author, but for some reason the investigation ended there. It was unusual for him to escape. His back generally kept fairly warm from one frailing to the next. His rewards were not all of a punitive nature. There were two medals in the school, one for spelling, the other for amiability. They were awarded once a week, and the holders wore them about the neck conspicuously and were envied accordingly. John Robards, he of the golden curls, wore almost continuously the medal for amiability, while Sam Clemens had a mortgage on the medal for spelling. Sometimes they traded to see how it would seem, but the master discouraged this practice by taking the medals away from them for the remainder of the week. Once Sam Clemens lost the medal by leaving the first R out of February. He could have spelled it backward if necessary, but Laura Hawkins was the only one on the floor against him, and he was a gallant boy. The picture of that school as presented in the book written thirty years later is faithful, we may believe, and the central figure is a tender-hearted, romantic, devil-may-care lad, loathing application and longing only for freedom. It was a boon which would come to him sooner even than he had dreamed. End of chapter 13 The Gentler Side Read by John Greenman This is section 14 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835-1866 Chapter 14 The Passing of John Clemens Judge Clemens, who time and again had wrecked or crippled his fortune by devices more or less unusual, now adopted the one unfailing method of achieving disaster. He endorsed a large note for a man of good repute, and the payment of it swept him clean. Home, property, everything vanished again. The St. Louis cousin took over the home and agreed to let the family occupy it on payment of a small interest, but after an attempt at housekeeping with a few scanty furnishings and Pamela's piano, all that had been saved from the wreck, they moved across the street into a portion of the Virginia house, then occupied by a Dr. Grant. The Grants proposed that the Clemens family move over and board them, a welcome arrangement enough at this time. Judge Clemens had still a hope left. The clerkship of the surrogate court was soon to be filled by election. It was an important remunerative office, and he was regarded as the favorite candidate for the position. His disaster had aroused general sympathy, and his nomination and election were considered sure. He took no chances. He made a canvas on horseback from house to house, often riding through rain and the chill of fall, acquiring a cough which was hard to overcome. He was elected by a heavy majority, and it was believed he could hold the office as long as he chose. There seemed no further need of worry. As soon as he was installed in office, they would live in style becoming their social position. About the end of February he rode to Palmyra to be sworn in. Returning he was drenched by a storm of rain and sleet, arriving at last half-frozen. His system was in no condition to resist such a shock. Pneumonia followed. Physicians came with torments of plasters and allopathic dosings that brought no relief. Orion returned from St. Louis to assist in caring for him, and sat by his bed, encouraging him and reading to him. 
but it was evident that he grew daily weaker. Now and then he became cheerful and spoke of the Tennessee land as the seed of a vast fortune that must surely flower at last. He uttered no regrets, no complaints. Once only, he said, I believe if I had stayed in Tennessee I might have been worth twenty thousand dollars today. On the morning of the 24th of March, 1847, it was evident that he could not live many hours. He was very weak. When he spoke now and then, it was of the land. He said it would soon make them all rich and happy. Cling to the land, he whispered. Cling to the land and wait. Let nothing beguile it away from you. A little later he beckoned to Pamela, now a lovely girl of nineteen, and, putting his arm about her neck, kissed her for the first time in years. "'Let me die,' he said. He never spoke after that. A little more, and the sad, weary life that had lasted less than forty-nine years was ended. A dreamer and a moralist, an upright man honored by all, he had never been a financier. He ended life with less than he had begun. End of chapter 14 The Passing of John Clemens Read by John Greenman This is section 15 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume One, Part One, eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six. Chapter fifteen. A young Ben Franklin. Read by John Greenman. For a third time, death had entered the Clemens home. Not only had it brought grief now, but it had banished the light of new fortune from the very threshold. The disaster seemed complete. The children were dazed. Judge Clemens had been a distant reserved man, but they had loved him, each in his own way, and they had honored his uprightness and nobility of purpose. Mrs. Clemens confided to a neighbor that, in spite of his manner, her husband had been always warm-hearted, with a deep affection for his family. They remembered that he had never returned from a journey without bringing each one some present, however trifling. Orion, looking out of his window next morning, saw old Abram Kurtz, and heard him laugh. He wondered how anybody could still laugh. The boy Sam was fairly broken down. Remorse, which always dealt with him unsparingly, laid a heavy hand on him now. Wildness, disobedience, indifference to his father's wishes, all were remembered. A hundred things, in themselves trifling, became ghastly and heart-wringing in the knowledge that they could never be undone. Seeing his grief, his mother took him by the hand and led him into the room where his father lay. "'It is all right, Sammy,' she said. "'What's done is done, and it does not matter to him any more. But here, by the side of him now, I want you to promise me.' He turned, his eyes streaming with tears, and flung himself into her arms. "'I will promise anything,' he sobbed, "'if you won't make me go to school. Anything.' His mother held him for a moment, thinking. Then she said, "'No, Sammy, you need not go to school any more. Only promise me to be a better boy. Promise not to break my heart." So he promised her to be a faithful and industrious man, and upright, like his father. His mother was satisfied with that. The sense of honor and justice was already strong within him. To him a promise was a serious matter at any time. Made under conditions like these, it would be held sacred. That night, it was after the funeral, his tendency to somnambulism manifested itself. His mother and sister, who were sleeping together, saw the door open and a form in white enter. Naturally nervous at such a time, and living in a day of almost universal superstition, 
They were terrified and covered their heads. Presently a hand was laid on the coverlet, first at the foot, then at the head of the bed. A thought struck Mrs. Clemens. Sam, she said. He answered, but he was sound asleep and fell to the floor. He had risen and thrown a sheet around him in his dreams. He walked in his sleep several nights in succession after that. Then he slept more soundly. Orion returned to St. Louis. He was a very good book and job printer by this time, and received a salary of ten dollars a week, high wages in those frugal days, of which he sent three dollars weekly to the family. Pamela, who had acquired a considerable knowledge of the piano and guitar, went to the town of Paris in Monroe County, about fifty miles away, and taught a class of music pupils, contributing whatever remained after paying for her board and clothing to the family fund. It was a hard task for the girl, for she was timid and not over-strong, but she was resolute and patient, and won success. Pamela Clemens was a noble character and deserves a fuller history than can be afforded in this work. Mrs. Clemens and her son Samuel now had a sober talk, and realizing that the printing trade offered opportunity for acquiring further education as well as a livelihood, they agreed that he should be apprenticed to Joseph P. Ament, who had lately moved from Palmyra to Hannibal and bought a weekly Democrat paper, the Missouri Courier. The apprentice terms were not over-liberal. They were the usual thing for that time, board and clothes. More board than clothes, and not much of either, Mark Twain used to say. I was supposed to get two suits of clothes a year, like a nigger, but I didn't get them. I got one suit and took the rest out in Ament's old garments, which didn't fit me in any noticeable way. I was only about half as big as he was, and when I had on one of his shirts I felt as if I had on a circus tent. I had to turn the trousers up to my ears to make them short enough. There was another apprentice, a young fellow of about eighteen, named Wales McCormick, a devilish fellow and a giant. Ament's clothes were too small for Wales, but he had to wear them, and Sam Clemens and Wales McCormick together, fitted out with Ament's clothes, must have been a picturesque pair. There was also, for a time, a boy named Ralph, but he appears to have presented no features of a striking sort, and the memory of him has become dim. The apprentices ate in the kitchen at first, served by the old slave cook and her handsome mulatto daughter, but those printers' devils made it so lively there that in due time they were promoted to the family table, where they sat with Mr. and Mrs. Ament and the one journeyman, Pet McMurray, a name that in itself was an inspiration. What those young scamps did not already know, Pet McMurray could teach them. Sam Clemens had promised to be a good boy, and he was, by the standards of boyhood. He was industrious, regular at his work, quick to learn, kind and truthful. Angels could hardly be more than that in a printing office, but when food was scarce even an angel, a young printer angel, could hardly resist slipping down the cellar stairs at night for raw potatoes, onions, and apples, which they carried into the office where the boys slept on a pallet on the floor, and this forage they cooked on the office stove. Wales especially had a way of cooking a potato that his associate never forgot. It is unfortunate that no photographic portrait has been preserved of Sam Clemens at this period, but we may imagine him from a letter which, long years after, Pet McMurray wrote to Mark Twain. He said, if your memory extends so far back, you will recall a little sandy-haired boy. The color of Mark Twain's hair in early life has been variously referred to as red, black, and brown. It was, in fact, as stated by McMurray, sandy in boyhood, deepening later to that rich mahogany tone known as auburn. Of nearly a quarter of a century ago, in the printing office at Hannibal, 
over the Brittingham drug store, mounted upon a little box at the case, pulling away at a huge cigar or a diminutive pipe, who used to love to sing so well the expression of the poor drunken man who was supposed to have fallen by the wayside, if ever I get up again I'll stay up if I can. Do you recollect any of the serious conflicts that mirth-loving brain of yours used to get you into with that diminutive creature Wales McCormick? How you used to call upon me to hold your cigar or pipe whilst you went entirely through him? This is good testimony without doubt. When he had been with Ament little more than a year, Sam had become office favorite and chief standby. Whatever required intelligence and care and imagination was given to Sam Clemens. He could set type as accurately and almost as rapidly as Pet McMurray. He could wash up the forms a good deal better than Pet, and he could run the job press to the tune of Annie Laurie or along the beach at Rockaway without missing a stroke or losing a finger. Sometimes, at odd moments, he would set up one of the popular songs or some favorite poem like The Blackberry Girl, and of these he sent copies printed on cotton, even on scraps of silk, to favorite girlfriends. Also to Puss Quarles on his uncle's farm, where he seldom went now, because he was really grown up, associating with men and doing a man's work. He had charge of the circulation, which is to say, he carried the papers. During the last year of the Mexican War, when a telegraph wire found its way across the Mississippi to Hannibal, a long, sagging span that for some reason did not break of its own weight, he was given charge of the extras with news from the front, and the burning importance of his mission, the bringing of news hot from the field of battle, spurred him to endeavors that won plaudits and success. He became a sort of sub-editor. When the forms of the paper were ready to close and Ament was needed to supply more matter, it was Sam who was delegated to find that rather uncertain and elusive person and labor with him until the required copy was produced. Thus it was he saw literature in the making. It is not believed that Sam had any writing ambitions of his own. His chief desire was to be an all-round journeyman printer like Pet McMurray, to drift up and down the world in Pet's untrammeled fashion, to see all that Pet had seen and a number of things which Pet appeared to have overlooked. He varied on occasion from this ambition. When the first Negro minstrel show visited Hannibal and had gone, he yearned for a brief period to be a magnificent middleman, or even the end man of that combination. When the circus came and went, he dreamed of the day when, a capering frescoed clown, he would set crowded tiers of spectators guffawing at his humor. When the traveling hypnotist arrived, he volunteered as a subject and amazed the audience by the marvel of his performance. In later life he claimed that he had not been hypnotized in any degree, but had been pretending throughout, a statement always denied by his mother and his brother Orion. This dispute was never settled, and never could be. Sam Clemens' tendency to somnambulism would seem to suggest that he really might have taken on a hypnotic condition while his consummate skill as an actor, then and always, and his early fondness of exhibition and a joke, would make it not unlikely that he was merely showing off and having his fun. He could follow the dictates of a vivid imagination and could be as outrageous as he chose, without incurring responsibility of any sort. But there was a penalty. He must allow pins and needles to be thrust into his flesh and suffer these tortures without showing discomfort to the spectators. It is difficult to believe that any boy, however great his exhibitory passion, could permit, in the full possession of his sensibilities, a needle to be thrust deeply into his flesh without manifestations of a most unmesmeric sort. The conclusion seems warranted that he began by pretending, but that at times he was at least under semi-mesmeric control. At all events he enjoyed a week of dazzling triumph, though in the end he concluded to stick to printing as a trade. We have said that he was a rapid learner and a neat workman. At Ament's he generally had a daily task, either of composition or press work, after which he was free. 
when he had got the hang of his work he was usually done by three in the afternoon then away to the river or the cave as in the old days sometimes with his boy friends sometimes with laura hawkins gathering wild columbine on that high cliff overlooking the river lover's leap he was becoming quite a beau attending parties on occasion where old-fashioned games forfeits ring around a rosy dusty miller and the like were regarded as rare amusements he was a favorite with girls of his own age he was always good-natured though he played jokes on them too and was often a severe trial he was with laura hawkins more than the others usually her escort on saturday afternoons in winter he carried her skates to bear creek and helped her to put them on after which they skated partners holding hands tightly and were a likely pair of children no doubt in the gilded age laura hawkins at twelve is pictured with her dainty hands propped into the ribbon-bordered pockets of her apron a vision to warm the coldest heart and bless and cheer the saddest the author had the real laura of his childhood in his mind when he wrote that though the story itself bears no resemblance to her life they were never really sweethearts those two they were good friends and comrades sometimes he brought her magazines exchanges from the printing office gaudies and others these were a treat for such things were scarce enough he cared little for reading himself beyond a few exciting tales though the putting into type of a good deal of miscellaneous matter had beyond doubt developed in him a taste for general knowledge it needed only to be awakened end of chapter fifteen a young ben franklin read by john greenman this is section sixteen of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter sixteen the turning point read by john greenman there came into his life just at this period one of those seemingly trifling incidents which viewed in retrospect assume pivotal proportions he was on his way from the office to his home one afternoon when he saw flying along the pavement a square of paper a leaf from a book at an earlier time he would not have bothered with it at all but any printed page had acquired a professional interest for him now he caught the flying scrap and examined it it was a leaf from some history of joan of arc the maid was described in the cage at rouen in the fortress and the two ruffian english soldiers had stolen her clothes there was a brief description and a good deal of dialogue her reproaches and their ribald replies he had never heard of the subject before he had never read any history when he wanted to know any fact he asked henry who read everything obtainable now however there arose within him a deep compassion for the gentle maid of orleans a burning resentment toward her captors a powerful and indestructible interest in her sad history it was an interest that would grow steadily for more than half a lifetime and culminate at last in that crowning work the recollections the loveliest story ever told of the martyred girl the incident meant even more than that it meant the awakening of his interest in all history the world's story in its many phases a passion which became the largest feature of his intellectual life and remained with him until his very last day on earth from the moment when that fluttering leaf was blown into his hands his career as one of the world's mentally elect was assured it gave him his cue the first word of a part in the human drama it crystallized suddenly within him sympathy with the oppressed rebellion against tyranny and treachery scorn for the divine rights of kings a few months before he died he wrote a paper on the turning point of my life for some reason he did not mention this incident yet if there was a turning point in his life he reached it that bleak afternoon on the streets of hannibal when a stray leaf from another life was blown into his hands 
He read hungrily now everything he could find relating to the French wars, and to Joan in particular. He acquired an appetite for history in general, the record of any nation or period. He seemed likely to become a student. Presently he began to feel the need of languages, French and German. There was no opportunity to acquire French that he could discover, but there was a German shoemaker in Hannibal who agreed to teach his native tongue. Sam Clemens got a friend, very likely it was John Briggs, to form a class with him, and together they arranged for lessons. The shoemaker had little or no English. They had no German. It would seem, however, that their teacher had some sort of a word-book, and when they assembled in his little cubbyhole of a retreat, he began reading aloud from it this puzzling sentence. Die Hein it flee whoop in die Heier. There, he said triumphantly, you know dos ward. The students looked at each other helplessly. The teacher repeated the sentence, and again they were helpless when he asked if they recognized it. Then in despair he showed them the book. It was an English primer, and the sentence was, The hen, it flies up in the air. They explained to him gently that it was German they wished to learn, not English, not under the circumstances. Later Sam made an attempt at Latin, and got a book for that purpose, but gave it up, saying, No! that language is not for me i'll do well enough to learn english a boy who took it up with him became a latin scholar his prejudice against oppression he put into practice boys who were being imposed upon found in him a ready protector sometimes watching a game of marbles or tops he would remark in his slow impressive way you mustn't cheat that boy and the cheating stopped when it didn't there was a combat with consequences end of chapter 16 the turning point read by john greenman this is section 17 of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne Volume One, Part One, 1835 to 1866, Chapter Seventeen, The Hannibal Journal, read by John Greenman. Orion returned from St. Louis. He felt that he was needed in Hannibal, and while wages there were lower, his expenses at home were slight. There was more real return for the family fund. His sister Pamela was teaching a class in Hannibal at this time. Orion was surprised when his mother and sister greeted him with kisses and tears. Any outward display of affection was new to him. The family had moved back across the street by this time. With Sam supporting himself, the earnings of Orion and Pamela provided at least a semblance of comfort. But Orion was not satisfied. Then, as always, he had a variety of vague ambitions. Oratory appealed to him and he delivered a temperance lecture with an accompaniment of music supplied chiefly by Pamela. He aspired to the study of law, a recurring inclination throughout his career. He also thought of the ministry, an ambition which Sam shared with him for a time. Every mischievous boy has it, sooner or later, though not all for the same reasons. It was the most earnest ambition I ever had. Mark Twain once remarked thoughtfully, not that I ever really wanted to be a preacher, but because it never occurred to me that a preacher could be damned. It looked like a safe job. A periodical ambition of Orion's was to own and conduct a paper in Hannibal. He felt that in such a position he might become a power in Western journalism. Once his father had considered buying the Hannibal Journal to give Orion a chance, and possibly to further his own political ambitions. Now Orion considered it for himself. The paper was for sale under a mortgage, and he was enabled to borrow the five hundred dollars which would secure ownership. Sam's two years at Amonts were now complete, 
and Orion induced him to take employment on the journal. Henry, at eleven, was taken out of school to learn typesetting. Orion was a gentle, accommodating soul, but he lacked force and independence. "'I followed all the advice I received,' he says in his record. "'If two or more persons conflicted with each other, I adopted the views of the last.' He started full of enthusiasm. He worked like a slave to save help, wrote his own editorials, and made his literary selections at night. The others worked, too. Orion gave them hard tasks and long hours. He had the feeling that the paper meant fortune or failure to them all, that all must labor without stint. In his usual self-accusing way he wrote afterward, I was tyrannical and unjust to Sam. He was as swift and as clean as a good journeyman. I gave him tasks, and if he got through well, I begrudged him the time, and made him work more. He set a clean proof, and Henry a very dirty one. The correcting was left to be done in the form the day before publication. Once we were kept late, and Sam complained with tears of bitterness that he was held till midnight on Henry's dirty proofs. Orion did not realize any injustice at the time. The game was too desperate to be played tenderly. His first editorials were so brilliant that it was not believed he could have written them. The paper throughout was excellent, and seemed on the high road to success. But the pace was too hard to maintain. Overwork brought weariness, and Orion's enthusiasm, never a very stable quantity, grew feeble. He became still more exacting. It is not to be supposed that Sam Clemens had given up all amusements to become merely a toiling drudge, or had conquered in any large degree his natural taste for amusement. He had become more studious, but after the long, hard days in the office it was not to be expected that a boy of fifteen would employ the evening, at least not every evening, in reading beneficial books. The river was always near at hand for swimming in the summer and skating in the winter, and once even at this late period it came near claiming a heavy tribute. That was one winter's night when, with another boy, he had skated until nearly midnight. They were about in the middle of the river when they heard a terrific and grinding noise near the shore. They knew what it was. The ice was breaking up, and they set out for home forthwith. It was moonlight and they could tell the ice from the water, which was a good thing, for there were wide cracks toward the shore, and they had to wait for these to close. They were an hour making the trip, and just before they reached the bank they came to a broad space of water. The ice was lifting and falling and crunching all around them. They waited as long as they dared and decided to leap from cake to cake. Sam made the crossing without accident, but his companion slipped in when a few feet from shore. He was a good swimmer and landed safely, but the bath probably cost him his hearing. He was taken very ill. One disease followed another, ending with scarlet fever and deafness. There was also entertainment in the office itself. A country boy named Jim Wolfe had come to learn the trade, a green, good-natured, bashful boy. In every trade tricks are played on the new apprentice, and Sam felt that it was his turn to play them. With John Briggs to help him, tortures for Jim Wolfe were invented and applied. They taught him to paddle a canoe, and upset him. They took him sniping at night, and left him holding the bag in the old traditional fashion while they slipped off home and went to bed. But Jim Wolfe's masterpiece of entertainment was one which he undertook on his own account. Pamela was having a candy pull downstairs one night, a grown-up candy pull to which the boys were not expected. Jim would not have gone anyway, for he was bashful beyond belief, and always dumb, and even pale with fear in the presence of pretty Pamela Clemens. Up in their room the boys could hear the merriment from below and could look out in the moonlight on the snowy sloping roof that came just beneath their window. Down at the eaves was the small arbor, green in summer, but covered now with dead vines and snow. They could hear the candy-makers come out now and then, doubtless setting out pans of candy to cool. 
By and by the whole party seemed to come out into the little arbor to try the candy. Perhaps the joking and laughter came plainly to the boys upstairs. About this time there appeared on the roof from somewhere two disreputable cats, who set up a most disturbing duel of charge and recrimination. Jim detested the noise, and perhaps was gallant enough to think it would disturb the party. He had nothing to throw at them, but he said, "'For two cents I'd get out there and knock their heads off.' "'You wouldn't dare to do it,' Sam said purringly. This was wormwood to Jim. He was really a brave spirit. "'I would, too,' he said. "'And I will, if you say that again.' "'Why, Jim, of course you wouldn't dare to go out there. You might catch cold.' "'You wait and see.' said Jim Wolf. He grabbed a pair of yarn stockings for his feet, raised the window, and crept out on the snowy roof. There was a crust of ice on the snow, but Jim jabbed his heels through it and stood up in the moonlight, his legs bare, his single garment flapping gently in the light winter breeze. Then he started slowly toward the cats, sinking his heels in the snow each time for a footing, a piece of lath in his hands. The cats were on the corner of the roof above the arbor, and Jim cautiously worked his way in that direction. The roof was not very steep. He was doing well enough until he came to a place where the snow had melted until it was nearly solid ice. He was so intent on the cats that he did not notice this, and when he struck his heel down to break the crust, nothing yielded. A second later Jim's feet had shot out from under him, and he vaulted like an avalanche down the icy roof, out on the little vine-clad arbor, and went crashing through among those candy-pullers, gathered there with their pans of cooling taffy. There were wild shrieks and a general flight. Neither Jim nor Sam ever knew how he got back to their room, but Jim was overcome with the enormity of his offense, while Sam was in an agony of laughter. "'You did it splendidly, Jim,' he drawled, when he could speak. "'Nobody could have done it better. And did you see how those cats got out of there? I never had any idea, when you started, that you meant to do it that way, and it was such a surprise to the folks downstairs. How did you ever think of it?" It was a fearful ordeal for a boy like Jim Wolfe, but he stuck to his place in spite of what he must have suffered. The boys made him one of them soon after that. His initiation was thought to be complete. An account of Jim Wolfe and the cats was the first original story Mark Twain ever told. He told it next day, which was Sunday to Jimmy McDaniel, the baker's son, as they sat looking out over the river, eating gingerbread. His hearer laughed immoderately, and the storyteller was proud and happy in his success. End of chapter 17 The Hannibal Journal Read by John Greenman This is section 18 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835-1866 Chapter 18 The Beginning of a Literary Life Read by John Greenman Orion's paper continued to go downhill. Following some random counsel, he changed the name of it and advanced the price. Two blunders. Then he was compelled to reduce the subscription, also the advertising rates. He was obliged to adopt a descending scale of charges and expenditures to keep pace with his declining circulation, a fatal sign. A publisher must lead his subscription list, not follow it. I was walking backward, he said, not seeing where I stepped. In desperation he broke away and made a trip to Tennessee to see if something could not be realized on the land, leaving his brother Sam in charge of the office. It was a journey without financial results. Yet it bore fruit, 
for it marked the beginning of Mark Twain's literary career. Sam, in his brother's absence, concluded to edit the paper in a way that would liven up the circulation. He had never done any writing, not for print, but he had the courage of his inclinations. His local items were of a kind known as spicy. His personals brought prompt demand for satisfaction. The editor of a rival paper had been in love and was said to have gone to the river one night to drown himself. Sam gave a picturesque account of this, with all the names connected with the affair. Then he took a couple of big wooden block letters, turned them upside down, and engraved illustrations for it, showing the victim wading out into the river with a stick to test the depth of the water. When this issue of the paper came out, the demand for it was very large. The press had to be kept running steadily to supply copies. The satirized editor at first swore that he would thrash the whole journal office. Then he left town and did not come back any more. The embryo Mark Twain also wrote a poem. It was addressed, To Mary in Hannibal. But the title was too long to be set in one column, so he left out all the letters in Hannibal, except the first and the last, and supplied their place with a dash, but with a startling result. Such were the early flickerings of a smoldering genius. Orion returned, remonstrated, and apologized. He reduced Sam to the ranks. In later years he saw his mistake. "'I could have distanced all competitors even then,' he said, "'if I had recognized Sam's ability and let him go ahead, merely keeping him from offending worthy persons.' Sam was subdued, but not done for. He never would be now. He had got his first taste of print, and he liked it. He promptly wrote two anecdotes, which he thought humorous, and sent them to the Philadelphia Saturday Evening Post. They were accepted, without payment, of course, in those days. And when the papers containing them appeared, he felt suddenly lifted to a lofty plane of literature. This was in 1851. Seeing them in print was a joy which rather exceeded anything in that line I have ever experienced since, he said nearly sixty years later. Yet he did not feel inspired to write anything further for the post. Twice during the next two years he contributed to the journal, once something about Jim Wolfe, though it was not the story of the cats, and another burlesque on a rival editor whom he pictured as hunting snipe with a cannon, the explosion of which was said to have blown the snipe out of the country. No contributions of this time have been preserved. High prices have been offered for copies of the Hannibal Journal containing them, but without success. The post sketches were unsigned and have not been identified. It is likely they were trivial enough. His earliest work showed no special individuality or merit, being mainly crude and imitative, as the work of a boy, even a precocious boy, is likely to be. He was not especially precocious, not in literature. His literary career would halt and hesitate and trifle along for many years yet, gathering impetus and equipment for the fuller, statelier swing which would bring a greater joy to the world at large even if not to himself, than that first far-off triumph. In Mark Twain's sketch, My First Literary Venture, he has set down with characteristic embroideries some account of this early authorship. Those were hard financial days. Orion could pay nothing on his mortgage, barely the interest. He had promised Sam three dollars and a half a week, but he could do no more than supply him with board and clothes. Poor shabby clothes he says in his record my mother and sister did the housekeeping my mother was cook she used the provisions i supplied her we therefore had a regular diet of bacon butter bread and coffee mrs clemens again took a few boarders pamela who had given up teaching for a time organized another music class orion became despondent one night a cow got into the office upset a typecase and ate up two composition rollers. 
Orion felt that fate was dealing with a heavy hand. Another disaster quickly followed. Fire broke out in the office, and the loss was considerable. An insurance company paid one hundred and fifty dollars. With it Orion replaced such articles as were absolutely needed for work, and removed his plant into the front room of the Clemens dwelling. He raised the one-story part of the building to give them an added room upstairs, and there for another two years, by hard work and pinching economies, the dying paper managed to drag along. It was the fire that furnished Sam Clemens with his Jim Wolf sketch. In it he stated that Jim, in his excitement, had carried the office broom half a mile, and had then come back after the washpan. In the meantime Pamela Clemens married. Her husband was a well-to-do merchant, William A. Moffat, formerly of Hannibal, but then of St. Louis, where he had provided her with the comforts of a substantial home. Orion tried the experiment of a serial story. He wrote to a number of well-known authors in the East, but was unable to find one who would supply a serial for the price he was willing to pay. Finally he obtained a translation of a French novel for the sum offered, which was five dollars. It did not save the sinking ship, however. He made the experiment of a tri-weekly without success. He noticed that even his mother no longer read his editorials, but turned to the general news. This was a final blow. I sat down in the dark, he says, the moon glinting in at the open door. I sat with one leg over the chair and let my mind float. He had received an offer of five hundred dollars for his office, the amount of the mortgage, and in his moonlight reverie he decided to dispose of it on those terms. This was 1853. His brother Samuel was no longer with him. Several months before, in June, Sam decided he would go out into the world. He was in his eighteenth year now, a good workman, faithful and industrious, but he had grown restless in unrewarded service. Beyond his mastery of the trade he had little to show for six years of hard labor. Once, when he had asked Orion for a few dollars to buy a second-hand gun, Orion, exasperated by desperate circumstances, fell into a passion and rated him for thinking of such extravagance. Soon afterward Sam confided to his mother that he was going away, that he believed Orion hated him, that there was no longer a place for him at home. He said he would go to St. Louis, where Pamela was. There would be work for him in St. Louis, and he could send money home. His intention was to go farther than St. Louis, but he dared not tell her. His mother put together, sadly enough, the few belongings of what she regarded as her one wayward boy. Then she held up a little testament. "'I want you to take hold of the other end of this, Sam,' she said, "'and make me a promise.' If one might have a true picture of that scene, the thin, wiry woman of forty-nine, her figure as straight as her deportment, gray-eyed, tender, and resolute, facing the fair-cheeked, auburn-haired youth of seventeen, his eyes as piercing and unwavering as her own. Mother and son, they were of the same metal and the same mold. I want you to repeat after me, Sam, these words. Jane Clemens said, I do solemnly swear that I will not throw a card or drink a drop of liquor while I am gone. He repeated the oath after her, and she kissed him. Remember that, Sam, and write to us, she said. And so, Orion records, he went wandering in search of that comfort and that advancement and those rewards of industry which he had failed to find where I was, gloomy, taciturn, and selfish. I not only missed his labor, we all missed his bounding activity and merriment. End of chapter 18 The Beginning of a Literary Life Read by John Greenman This is section 19 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835-1866 
Chapter 19 In the Footsteps of Franklin He went to St. Louis by the night boat, visited his sister Pamela, and found a job in the composing room of the evening news. He remained on the paper only long enough to earn money with which to see the world. The world was New York City, where the Crystal Palace Fair was then going on. The railway had been completed by this time, but he had not traveled on it. It had not many comforts. Several days and nights were required for the New York trip, yet it was a wonderful and beautiful experience. He felt that even Pet McMurray could hardly have done anything to surpass it. He arrived in New York with two or three dollars in his pocket and a ten-dollar bill concealed in the lining of his coat. New York was a great and amazing city. It almost frightened him. It covered the entire lower end of Manhattan Island. Visionary citizens boasted that one day it would cover it all. The World's Fair building, the Crystal Palace, stood a good way out. It was where Bryant Park is now, on 42nd Street and 6th Avenue. Young Clemens classed it as one of the wonders of the world, and wrote lavishly of its marvels. A portion of a letter to his sister Pamela has been preserved, and is given here not only for what it contains, but as the earliest existing specimen of his composition. The fragment concludes what was doubtless an exhaustive description. From the gallery, second floor, you have a glorious sight the flags of the different countries represented the lofty dome glittering jewelry gaudy tapestry etc with the busy crowd passing to and fro tis a perfect fairy palace beautiful beyond description the machinery department is on the main floor but i cannot enumerate any of it on account of the lateness of the hour past one o'clock it would take more than a week to examine everything on exhibition and i was only in a little over two hours to-night i only glanced at about one-third of the articles and having a poor memory i have enumerated scarcely any of even the principal objects. The visitors to the palace average six thousand daily, <laughs> double the population of Hannibal. The price of admission being fifty cents, they take in about three thousand dollars. The Latting Observatory, height about two hundred and eighty feet, is near the palace. From it you can obtain a grand view of the city and the country around. The Croton Aqueduct, to supply the city with water, is the greatest wonder yet. Immense sewers are laid across the bed of the Hudson River and pass through the country to Westchester County, where a whole river is turned from its course and brought to New York. From the reservoir in the city to the Westchester County Reservoir, the distance is thirty-eight miles, and, if necessary, they could easily supply every family in New York with one hundred barrels of water per day. I am very sorry to learn that Henry has been sick. He ought to go to the country and take exercise, for he is not half so healthy as Ma thinks he is. If he had my walking to do, he would be another boy entirely. Four times every day I walk a little over a mile, and working hard all day and walking four miles is exercise. I am used to it now, though, and it is no trouble. Where is it Orion's going to? Tell Ma my promises are faithfully kept, and if I have my health, I will take her to Kentucky in the spring. I shall save money for this. 
tell Jim Wolf and all the rest of them to write, and give me all the news. It has just struck 2 a.m., and I always get up at 6, and am at work at 7. You ask where I spend my evenings. Where would you suppose, with a free printer's library containing more than 4,000 volumes within a quarter of a mile of me, and nobody at home to talk to. Write soon. Truly your brother, Sam. P.S. I have written this by a light so dim that you nor Ma could not read by it. Write, and let me know how Henry is. It is a good letter. It is direct and clear in its descriptive quality, and it gives us a scale of things. Double the population of Hannibal visited the Crystal Palace in one day, and the water to supply the city came a distance of thirty-eight miles. Doubtless these were amazing statistics. Then there was the interest in family affairs, always strong, his concern for Henry, whom he loved tenderly, his memory of the promise to his mother his understanding of her craving to visit her old home. He did not write to her direct, for the reason that Orion's plans were then uncertain, and it was not unlikely that he had already found a new location. From this letter, too, we learn that the boy who detested school was reveling in a library of four thousand books, more than he had ever seen together before. We have somehow the feeling that he had all at once stepped from boyhood to manhood and that the separation was marked by a very definite line. The work he had secured was in Cliff Street, in the printing establishment of John A. Gray and Green, who agreed to pay him four dollars a week, and did pay that amount in wildcat money, which saved them from twenty-five per cent of the sum. He lodged at a mechanics boarding house in Duane Street, and when he had paid his board and washing, he sometimes had as much as fifty cents to lay away. He did not like the board. He had been accustomed to the southern mode of cooking, and wrote home complaining that New Yorkers did not have hot bread or biscuits, but ate light bread, which they allowed to get stale, seeming to prefer it in that way. On the whole there was not much inducement to remain in New York after he had satisfied himself with its wonders. He lingered, however, through the hot months of 1853, and found it not easy to go. In October he wrote to Pamela, suggesting plans for Orion, also for Henry and Jim Wolfe, whom he seems never to have overlooked. Among other things he says, I have not written to any of the family for some time, from the fact, firstly, that I didn't know where they were, and, secondly, because I have been fooling myself with the idea that I was going to leave New York every day for the last two weeks. I have taken a liking to the abominable place, and every time I get ready to leave I put it off a day or so from some unaccountable cause. I think I shall get off Tuesday, though. Edwin Forrest has been playing for the last sixteen days at the Broadway Theater, but I never went to see him till last night. The play was The Gladiator. I did not like parts of it much, but other portions were really splendid. In the latter part of the last act, where the gladiator, Forrest, dies at his brother's feet, in all the fierce pleasure of gratified revenge, the man's whole soul seems absorbed in the part he is playing, and it is really startling to see him. I am sorry I did not see him play Damon and Pythias the former character being the greatest. He appears in Philadelphia on Monday night. I have not 
received a letter from home lately, but got a journal the other day in which I see the office has been sold. If my letters do not come often, you need not bother yourself about me, for if you have a brother nearly eighteen years of age who is not able to take care of himself a few miles from home, such a brother is not worth one's thoughts. And if I don't manage to take care of number one, be assured you will never know it. I am not afraid, however. I shall ask favors of no one and endeavor to be, and shall be, as independent as a wood sawyer's clerk. Passage to Albany, a hundred and sixty miles on the finest steamers that ply the Hudson, is now twenty-five cents, cheap enough, but is generally cheaper than that in the summer. I have been fooling myself with the idea that I was going to leave New York, is distinctly a Mark Twain phrase. He might have said that fifty years later. He did go to Philadelphia presently and found work subbing on a daily paper, The Inquirer. He was a fairly swift compositor. He could set ten thousand M's a day, and he received pay according to the amount of work done. Days or evenings, when there was no vacant place for him to fill, he visited historic sites, the art galleries, and the libraries. He was still acquiring education, you see. Sometimes at night, when he returned to his boarding-house, his roommate, an Englishman named Sumner, grilled a herring, and this was regarded as a feast. He tried his hand at writing in Philadelphia, though this time without success. For some reason he did not again attempt to get into the post, but offered his contributions to the Philadelphia Ledger, mainly poetry of an obituary kind. Perhaps it was burlesque. He never confessed that, but it seems unlikely that any other obituary poetry would have failed of print. My efforts were not received with approval, was all he ever said of it afterward. There were two or three characters in the Inquirer office whom he did not forget. One of these was an old compositor who had held a case in that office for many years. His name was Frog, and sometimes when he went away the office devils would hang a line over his case with a hook on it baited with a piece of red flannel. They never got tired of this joke, and Frog was always able to get as mad over it as he had been in the beginning. Another old fellow there furnished amusement. He owned a house in a distant part of the city and had an abnormal fear of fire. Now and then, when everything was quiet except the clicking of the types, someone would step to the window and say with a concerned air, "'Doesn't that smoke, or that light, if it was evening, seem to be in the northwestern part of the city? Or, there go the fire-bells again!' and away the old man would tramp up to the roof to investigate. It was not the most considerate sport, and it is to be feared that Sam Clemens had his share in it. He found that he liked Philadelphia. He could save a little money there, for one thing, and now and then sent something to his mother, small amounts, but welcome and gratifying, no doubt. In a letter to Orion, whom he seems to have forgiven with absence, written October 26th, he encloses a gold dollar to buy her a handkerchief, and to serve as a specimen of the kind of stuff we are paid with in Philadelphia. Further along he adds, Unlike New York, I like this Philadelphia amazingly, and the people in it. There is only one thing that gets my dander up, and that is the hands are always encouraging me, telling me it's no use to get discouraged, no use to be downhearted, for there is more work here than you can do. Downhearted, the devil! I have not had a particle of such a feeling 
since I left Hannibal more than four months ago. I fancy they'll have to wait some time till they see me downhearted or afraid of starving while I have strength to work and am in a city of 400,000 inhabitants. When I was in Hannibal, before I had scarcely stepped out of the town limits, nothing could have convinced me that I would starve as soon as I got a little way from home. He mentions the grave of Franklin in Christ Churchyard with its inscription, Benjamin and Deborah Franklin, and one is sharply reminded of the similarity between the early careers of Benjamin Franklin and Samuel Clemens. Each learned the printer's trade. Each worked in his brother's printing office and wrote for the paper. Each left quietly and went to New York, and from New York to Philadelphia as a journeyman printer. Each in due season became a world figure, many-sided, human, and of incredible popularity. The foregoing letter ends with a long description of a trip made on the Fairmont stage. It is a good, vivid description, impressions of a fresh, sensitive mind, set down with little effort at fine writing, a letter to convey literal rather than literary enjoyment. The Wire Bridge, Fairmount Park and Reservoir, new buildings, all these passed in review. A fine residence about completed impressed him. It was built entirely of great blocks of red granite. The pillars in front were all finished but one. These pillars were beautiful, ornamental, fluted columns, considerably larger than a hogshead at the base, and about as high as Clappinger's second-story front windows. To see some of them finished and standing, and then the huge blocks lying about, looks so massy and carries one in imagination to the ruined piles of ancient Babylon. I despise the infernal bogus brick columns plastered over with mortar. Marble is the cheapest building stone about Philadelphia. There is a flavor of the innocence about it. Then, a little further along, I saw small steamboats with their signs up, for Wissahickon and Maniunk, twenty-five cents. George Lippard, in his Legends of Washington and his Generals, has rendered the Wissahickon sacred in my eyes, and I shall make that trip as well as one to Germantown soon. There is one fine custom observed in Philadelphia. A gentleman is always expected to hand up a lady's money for her. Yesterday I sat in the front end of the bus, directly under the driver's box. A lady sat opposite me. She handed me her money, which was right. But, Lord, a St. Louis lady would think herself ruined if she should be so familiar with a stranger. In St. Louis a man will sit in the front end of the stage and see a lady stagger from the far end to pay her fare. There are two more letters from Philadelphia, one of November 28th to Orion, who by this time had bought a paper in Muscatine, Iowa, and located the family there, and one to Pamela dated December 5th. Evidently Orion had realized that his brother might be of value as a contributor, for the latter says, I will try to write for the paper occasionally, but I fear my letters will be very uninteresting, for this incessant night work dulls one's ideas amazingly. I believe I am the only person in the inquirer office that does not drink. One young fellow makes eighteen dollars for a few weeks and gets on a grand 
bender and spends every cent of it how do you like free soil i would like amazingly to see a good old-fashioned negro my love to all truly your brother sam in the letter to pamela he is clearly homesick i only want to return to avoid night work which is injuring my eyes is the excuse but in the next sentence he complains of the scarcity of letters from home and those not written as they should be one only has to leave home to learn how to write interesting letters to an absent friend he says and in conclusion i don't like our present prospect for cold weather at all he had been gone half a year and the first attack of home longing for a boy of his age was due the novelty of things had worn off it was coming on winter changes had taken place among his home people and friends the life he had known best and longest was going on and he had no part in it leaning over his case he sometimes hummed an exile from home splendor dazzles in vain he weathered the attack and stuck it out for more than a half a year longer in january when the days were dark and he grew depressed he made a trip to washington to see the sights of the capital his stay was comparatively brief and he did not work there he returned to philadelphia working for a time on the ledger and north american finally he went back to new york there are no letters of this period his second experience in new york appears not to have been recorded and in later years was only vaguely remembered it was late in the summer of eighteen fifty four when he finally set out on his return to the west his wanderjahr had lasted nearly fifteen months he went directly to st louis sitting up three days and nights in a smoking car to make the journey he was worn out when he arrived but stopped there only a few hours to see pamela it was his mother he was anxious for he took the keokuk packet that night and flinging himself on his berth slept the clock three times around scarcely rousing or turning over only waking at last at muscatine for a long time that missing day confused his calculations when he reached orion's house the family sat at breakfast he came in carrying a gun they had not been expecting him and there was a general outcry and a rush in his direction he warded them off holding the butt of the gun in front of him you wouldn't let me buy a gun he said so i bought one myself and i'm going to use it now in self-defense you sam you sam cried jane clemens behave yourself for she was wary of a gun then he had had his joke and gave himself into his mother's arms end of chapter nineteen in the footsteps of franklin read by john greenman